Hello, I am Kelly. This is Isolation Protocol Day 265. 265. Wow. It is... Uh, I don't know what day it is. December 6th. I think today is Sunday. Is today Sunday? Yeah, Sunday. So, uh... You haven't heard from me for a while because I was doing NaNoWriMo and slumming out words as fast as I could. I've got uh, 52, almost 53,000 words done in middle of nowhere. Right at this point, it is just really, really rough, rough draft. Uh, I don't add any descriptions uh, or very, very few. Um, mostly, I just wanted to get the story down. So I pretty much just told the story instead of actually writing the book. So my next step is filling in a few of the scenes, uh, adding some foreshadowing, and then switching the whole thing over to telling in uh, showing instead of telling so uh it's going to be a lot of work but i've got the story down it is so convoluted i cannot believe it i started with nothing pretty much an idea of what would happen if a spaceship got stuck in the middle of nowhere and started pulling people aboard instead of pulling themselves out of the middle of nowhere so that's where i ran with it and my whole premise developed by about the, okay, I can't call them chapters because I didn't really divide it up into chapters, but about the 10th or 12th scene, um, and I put usually about three scenes per chapter, uh, so somewhere around the 10,000 word mark, I it, it clicked what the premise is going to be, and it is that um, these people are getting pulled from a lot of different points in time, and they are working really hard not to create any temporal anomalies or paradoxes by not letting the people talk to each other. Um, they can't give them information that's going to happen in the future, like somebody from 1974 can't find out from somebody in 1990 that he's going to need to buy Apple stock or whatever. So anyhow, um, uh, <sighs> yeah, it is really, really rough. But I also managed to get in eight, I think eight of the little Easter eggs that I hide in every every novel. So um, I'm just going to squeeze the other four in, four or five, I think I I forgot, I, my list is not handy, but um, yeah, I squeeze in little Easter eggs into all of my, my novels and stories. Short stories may have one or two, usually two or three. Um, novellas, I've written a couple of novellas and they have about five of the various different things. And uh, for the novels, I try to get all at 13. 13 on my list. All 13 of the little Easter eggs hidden. Uh, in this scene here that I was just looking at, the hidden object is a spork. Yes, in the future they don't use knives and forks and spoons, they pretty much use a spork. That's it. Um, the, the, muck, the, the stuff that they have to eat on this spaceship uh, it's it's a running joke throughout the whole thing. They call it mush. There's the brown mush for breakfast, and the yellow mush for lunch, and the white mush for dinner. And uh, occasionally they'll mix it up, and they'll have the white mush for lunch and the yellow mush for dinner. But it's a, a hash of um, artificial protein or no, plant-based proteins, um, vegetables, and uh, pretty much that's about it. <laughs> Um, and some and a grain, a whole grains, and uh, the premise behind that being that as a colony ship, they 
get the dietary restrictions of all the colonists. And when you get together 3,800 people, um, let me rephrase that, 38,000 people on this huge colony ship, and they have various different allergies and stuff to make it easier to feed everybody. They simply don't allow any food on board that anybody might be allergic to, which means that their diet is pretty bad. Uh, no flavor, no spices, no herbs, nothing. It's just mush. And uh, they get it in a bowl uh, and they eat it with a spork. There's the hot mush and they also get a cold mush, which is um, pretty much like a fruit salad. Uh, but because it's been frozen and then thawed, it's mush. So, yeah, they get the it's the savory mush and the sweet mush, but it's not really savory and sweet. It's vegetable and fruit. So anyhow, uh, yeah, this, the book is... The first draft is finished, mm -hmm. and I am brain dead. Uh, the last day that I wrote, I did a marathon of uh, 12 and a half hours and managed to get... Well, first of all, I usually started writing around nine o'clock at night. I would finish around one or two in the morning. Um, but because of the way that you put in the words that you add in and such, um, if you add, if you start before midnight and finish after midnight, it counts it on the following day. And that was mis um, confusing me when I was trying to figure out how many words per day I'd written. So I would stop at midnight, put in my word count, and then start writing again, and then count the words that I wrote after midnight with the following night's word count. So um, I wrote about 4,000 words after midnight. I wrote until 4.30 in the morning, typing as fast as I could. Got up again around 10 and Wrote, took a took a short break for lunch for dinner, and um, all right, I had one meal, and it pretty much it was the mush that they're talking about, um, uh, and wrote until almost midnight, and put in my word count, hoping it wouldn't be too far from fifty thousand, and I had fifty thousand one hundred and fifty two words, and I said yay, save, validate, and went to sleep, and four days later I woke up. So anyhow, uh, I cannot really do too much of that because it wears me out. Mentally, my brain can't handle it, especially a story as convoluted as this. Uh, it's, it's a huge cast of characters. I did not count, but I have four pages that basically just list the characters that are in this, and they all... Um, they're all involved, not, not some, not quite as much as others, but, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're all, they're all important. Um, I have just their name, rank, uh, the, if, if it's a passenger, it's a year that they were, were from, uh, ages and job on the ship. Uh, or job at home before they got on the ship. One of them is a surfer who, it's a guy from 1974 who is taking a uh, taking a break for a year to figure out what he wants his major to be in college. He's uh, already finished his first two years of college and um, hasn't decided what he wants to do yet, so he's taking a year off and circling the world going surfing. Uh, he gets pulled aboard the ship mid-wave. Uh, he's inside of a tube, and the next thing you know, he's on the ship along with half the wave. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, he <laughs> caused a lot of flooding in the ship. Uh, but he's sitting there with, um, you know, his board shorts and a Hawaiian shirt and, um, and a surfboard. Uh, so uh, that's, you know, they didn't have any clothes or anything, of course. They just had what they had on their on their bodies and um, when they were pulled aboard the ship. Um, so, uh, yeah, he had he spends the whole the whole book 
wearing nothing but board shorts and a Hawaiian shirt and talking about a surfboard. Uh, and things like that. So things that happen on the ship help him decide what he's going to be when he grows up, as he calls it, uh, what, what college major he wants to, to pursue. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Uh, for example, the, the paradoxes that they're trying to avoid actually causes more paradoxes. So um, the, the surfer, for example, um, uh, likes this little girl who doesn't speak any, any English and nobody speaks her language, but she gets sick and he helps take care of her and he talks to the doctor on the ship and he decides and finds out that this disease that she's got is a disease that nearly wiped out all of the humans on planet Earth, which is why there's such a huge push to colonize other planets because they want to keep some humans somewhere alive. Even if, if every human on Earth were, were to die, they didn't want to kill out the entire human race. So they're creating these colonies. So he decides that he wants to study pandemics and he wants to become a doctor. Uh, and 50 years later, when he's 70 years old, 71 years old, um, he's part of a team that is working on developing protocols for COVID-19 and um, the protocols that they do, that they determine um, uh, to help kind of a global response to this thing. Um, they're, they're not able to get a global response, but they set up an agency for future pandemics that will cause a global response so that they can stop the pandemics as fast as possible. So he does that and uh, it's because of him that they are doing the, because of what he did, that they're doing the colonizing of the other planets. And because they were colonizing the other planets, he decided to become a doctor. So it's a cycle. They're all, all cycles like that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a girl who is um, pregnant and she decides to name her daughter after the stewardess on the ship. And it turns out that the stewardess on the ship is her great, 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 great granddaughter. And that name that she chooses, which is an unusual name, even for the time, it's an, it's a unique name. Um, so that name, there's always somebody in every generation who has that name. So she doesn't know, of course, she just figures she named her daughter after this stewardess and the stewardess is named after her daughter eventually. So, uh, yeah, it's, it was so much fun trying to come up with all these different paradoxes. Uh, I've got six major paradoxes and a lot of, um, much more minor ones. Um, like there's a couple that, um, is the only couple that came aboard. Everybody else came, came aboard um, on their own. Uh, there were two birds that came aboard because they both flew together or close enough together. But this couple was dancing. They were given dancing lessons anonymously and they think it's from one of their foster kids. Well, it is, except that the foster kid is the one who is the little girl who doesn't speak English. And um, uh, she's when she grows up, she gives them dancing lessons and another girl, uh, another woman on the ship um, is going to be hosting their 50th wedding anniversary, but they don't recognize her because first of all, to them, they are almost 50 years in her future. So she's much older at the time and um, it, it, it's, yeah. There's a lot of confusing stuff in here trying to keep track of who came from what time and how old they would be at various different points and how they're all connected. And wow, I had so much fun writing this thing. Anyhow, on to something else. Um, in between all of that, to give my brain a break, I was doing some knitting and crocheting, of course. Finished a pair of socks for Christmas. 
My son does not watch this channel, so he can show off these socks. Nice, really squishy, thick. Oh, they're so squishy and thick. Um, Croy socks. I added a solid heel and a solid toe so that it didn't interrupt the stripe pattern on the instep. So, uh, yeah, got a nice thick pair of winter wooly socks uh, for a niece who is about two and a half um, or almost two and a half. I made a poncho or making a poncho. I'm still putting on the fuzzy border. Yep, fuzzy border. So she's got this little teeny tiny poncho. It is so cute. I'm going to add a neckband because I don't want this falling off her shoulders, but this had to be big enough to go over a toddler's heads, which are kind of big. So I'm going to put a little bit of ribbing around that. And then, of course, I'm adding the fuzz on the bottom. So this is um, <sighs> Premier Bloom. And I did it in a um, seed stitch, also called the rice stitch. It's uh, two rows of knit pearl, knit pearl, and then two rows of pearl, knit pearl, knit. So uh, I love the way that this bloom turned out. It really does look like little rows of rose bushes. It's so cute and so, oh my gosh, so soft. I almost want to make myself a sweater out of it, but uh, matching up those stripes would be a pain. So uh, I've got that going. Uh, when I finished the socks for my son, um, what I have been doing, because I had so many, so many balls of sock yarn, put them into paper bags so I didn't know what I was going to do next. And the next one that I chose is um oh my gosh what's the brand name on this uh heart and soul by red heart the um <laughs> labels falling apart but it is really really cute color this is not coming out too much sunlight there we go sunlight behind it so it's pretty purple and I'm putting a solid purple heel. I just finished doing the heel turn. And then it's going to have a solid purple toe as well. So uh, these I think I'm going to keep for me. They are of pretty long legs so that I can wear them with boots. And I'm doing it in the Hermione stitch. So they're real squishy, but they're not dense and heavy. Um, not like my son's, which are real, real thick, dense and heavy. Um, I used a slightly smaller needle and a rib to make them really extra warm and uh, because he lives where it gets cold. And I live near the beach in California, so yeah, even though I'm bundled up right now, um, it really doesn't get as cold as it does where he is. So uh, yeah, there's that. Uh, purples and grays and maroon and um, one of the grays is kind of greenish, so can't wait to wear those. Uh, anything else? That is about it for that. Uh, I did fall asleep knitting the other night, knitting those socks, and woke up with a knitting needle stabbed right through the middle of my palm. So no more knitting when I'm that tired, especially with those itty bitty little sharp pointy needles because that hurt and I'm still having a hard time moving my hand because it just it's throbbing and it's painful. Uh, didn't get too red, didn't get too puffy, so um, I just you know up until earlier today I had a band-aid on it so yeah it should be fine. Um, and it is, uh, something else I was gonna say and I am babbling because I can't remember what it was. There's something else here I was gonna show up. No. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'll show that later. Um, I ordered some mini skeins. Let's see. Um, in a in a kit. They're so guy. They're so tiny. This. Oh my God. The colors are just adorable. Uh, the lighting in here is terrible because I've got the sun behind me. There we go. Isn't that gorgeous? And um, it came in a group of five colors. 
and I rolled this, some of them into balls and I am doing a cowl yeah I know I said I wasn't going to show I'm showing anyway I'm doing a cowl in the Catherine's wheel stitch but I'm using a larger crochet hook than it really should be so that it's got a lot more drape to it so it's just going to be a lot of random um, circles basically really cute really cute it is so much prettier in person than you can then it's showing up on the screen uh and that one is going to be for me it's just going to be a small cowl I got that and and oh I can't reach it okay you can doubt using it needle to grab something oh there's my hat let me grab it back uh, this is from oh, I hope her name is on here this is from a dyer in England uh, Mimo Yarn Co in London M-I-M-O and I ordered Christmas yarn oh, you're coming in coming in twisted so this one is called fairy lights so pretty and this one is holly berries now the holly berry has got a tiny bit of sparkle in it and I'm still still debating whether or not I want to use the two in a project but I just at this point yeah I'm going to use them in a project even though one's slightly sparkly so they look really cute together uh, the holly berry is a slightly thicker um, fingering weight it is uh, 100 grams 400 meters 75 percent merino wool 25 percent nylon and a little bit of gold stellina sparkle and then the fairy lights is uh, 425 meters 100 grams um, 75 percent um, bfl blue blue bfl it's a type of sheep and 25 percent nylon so yeah they're ooh, they go well enough together so I still have not like I said decided with them if I'm going to put them together or not but I may they're oh, so gorgeous so that will be another project that I need to do, to do something with and that's also where I got those little mini skeins from and uh, the mini skeins when she when I saw it on the website it, they just reminded me of um, some kind of Middle Eastern Persian something or other colors so I just had to do something with that yeah I was going to read a little bit but I talked way too much about my story so I will catch you next time for uh, maybe an excerpt or something from this mess this tangled mess uh called um the middle of nowhere or maybe you can call me al um haven't decided what i'm going to title yet but the working title is middle of nowhere and i'm kind of leaning towards you can call me al as the title so all right well that's it for today and i will try to uh do some more updates a little bit more often now that i am not writing like crazy all day every day and trying to get some knitting done uh just to give my, my brain a break so yeah I hope this dog's snoring didn't bother you too much because uh, it's yeah bothering me but uh, my microphone is terrible so it probably didn't pick him up bye